This morning, we are continuing to think about what it means to be United Methodist, what is distinctive about the United Methodist Church, that is, what do we emphasize as United Methodist. In this series, I've entitled The United Methodist Way. This morning, I want to talk in these few minutes about uh, the United Methodist Way as a way of making the world a better place. And this goes back to the very beginning of the Methodist movement and throughout the Methodist movement that has been an emphasis of ours. Our stated mission of the denomination is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. What we're engaged in is the transformation of our lives, and in that transformation then is the transformation of the world as we go about being God's people in it. As I said, this goes back to the days of the early Methodist movement, but of course it goes back to the very beginning of Christianity. Jesus is preaching his first sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth, in his little hometown synagogue. It's a little village, and he is, has just been through this experience that Luke describes of being tested in the wilderness. And in that testing in the wilderness, he becomes clear about who he is and who God is calling him to be and what God has called him to do. And so then he begins his public ministry in the synagogue teaching. He's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah by the attendant, the assistant in the synagogue. He stands up to read as the custom is, and he turns in the scroll to the place where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the, uh, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he handed the scroll back and he sat down, which is the tradition for teaching in a sitting position. And he said to them, as all eyes were on him, Luke says, in the synagogue, today this scripture is fulfilled just as you have heard it. All eyes were on him, I'm sure, because they were interested to know, what is this carpenter, this son of Joseph, what is he going to say to us about that scripture? But more than that, <clears throat> Those eyes were probably on him because he stopped reading from the book of Isaiah just as he was getting to the good part. Because the next word of Isaiah is this, proclaim the year of the, uh, of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God. That's the next phrase. And then Isaiah goes on to describe how the tables are going to be turned and, and those foreigners that have oppressed the people, those foreigners that have made them work in the fields and have made the people uh, dress the vines in the vineyards and have made the people tend the sheep and they have gotten wealthy off of that. The tables will be turned and those foreigners, Isaiah said, they will be the ones that will tend your fields and they will watch your, or till your fields and watch your flocks and vest the, dress the vines in, in, uh, in your vineyard and you'll get rich off of them. But Jesus doesn't read any of that. He stops with and proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sits down. And he says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he tells a couple of Bible stories that anyone in the room would know. And they were stories that pointed to God's favor being poured out on Gentiles, those who were not people of the same faith and of the same um, nationality. And those are Bible stories everybody knew. There's the widow of Zarephath. She's not uh, a Jew, and yet she receives God's favor. When there were a lot of other uh, widows who needed help, Jesus said it was to that widow that God sent help. And, and there were many people needing healing of leprosy, but it was to Naaman, a Syrian general, that God sent healing for his leprosy. And when he told those stories, the people rose up, they grabbed him, and they took him to the brow of a hill to throw him down the hill uh, to teach him a lesson. 
perhaps to injure him for sure, and maybe even to kill him because they didn't like those words of grace extended to everybody. It was a difficult beginning for Jesus' ministry and one that would mark, would signal what much of his ministry would be like as he went about seeking to bring in this kingdom, not a kingdom that people might have thought, not overthrowing the Roman oppressors, not turning the tables so that those oppressors would become the servants of the people, but rather the kingdom of God, where God's will is done on earth as in heaven, as he taught us in the prayer. He laid out his mission to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to those who were blind either to hope or to the plight of a brother and a sister, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, the time when all debts are forgiven, the time when people can begin anew and begin again, a beautiful symbol of the grace of God. But here he is, this carpenter from Nazareth, and what is he supposed to do about all that's going on in the world, all the difficulties that the people who heard it faced? And yet he gathered his followers, and he taught them, and they followed him, and they watched him, and they learned. And following his death and resurrection, as he is present in the church, those followers that continue to become followers of his, they continue the mission that is the mission that he came to, uh, to live and to teach and to make possible. And whenever we have been followers of Jesus at our best, we have been a part of that mission of making the world a better place in all those ways that Jesus taught and lived. It is a matter of being transformed by the grace and love of God in Christ and then living out of that, following Christ in his mission. And Paul said, together we are the body of Christ engaged in that work. This is in our DNA as United Methodists. The very beginning of the Methodist movement, John Wesley and those who were the early Methodists who wanted to really live the faith, they knew that there was, as John Wesley said, no holiness without social holiness without making the world a better place. And so they devoted themselves to this same mission of proclaiming good news to the poor and uh, proclaiming release to the captives and, and recovery of, of a vision of, of, uh, of what God is doing in the world, a vision that all people are children of God, a vision that, uh, that is of hope for those who are oppressed and of making the world a better place in all that they did. And so that movement was born into a very difficult world as well. The 18th century, uh, 18th century England was a dark and difficult place for most people who lived there. Did you know that three quarters of the children in London, the children born in London, died before the age of five? Did you know that people were engaged, almost all of the people, many of the people, in spirit-killing, soul-crushing, life-shortening kinds of work? Did you know that the gap between the, the rich and the poor was so wide no one could even imagine it ever being bridged at all in 18th century England? There was a huge drug and alcohol problem in in England. I mean, Parliament was adjourned a number of times in the 18th century, the records show, because the members of Parliament were too drunk to conduct the business of state. It was a difficult time. Did you know that in 1684, there were about 520,000 gallons of distilled liquor produced uh, from the grains, grain alcohol? By the middle of the 18th century, it was 11 million gallons. And you wonder why the early Methodists 
uh, worked against the, the production of grain alcohol. It wasn't some simply a moral compunction. I mean, it wasn't as though something was wrong inherently with alcohol. After all, uh, John Wesley even brewed his own beer, as a matter of fact. It was because the production of grain alcohol had gotten to the point where the grain grown for bread had become so expensive because most of it was going to the production of alcohol that the poor could not afford to buy a loaf of bread. So you see, the issue was this larger picture of what kind of world uh, are we creating and have we created. The first schools available to the poor were Sunday schools founded by the Methodist movement, not just to teach scripture, but to teach people how to read and to teach people life skills because education was not available to many people otherwise. Did you know that the first clinic offering free medical treatment in London was founded by the Methodist movement? Did you know that the Methodist movement was engaged in founding missions everywhere that fed people? And did you know that the Methodist movement, were, that was the first uh, movement to put in place micro-lending, which is something we talk about a lot about now, small loans that allow people to pull themselves out of poverty and to establish a small business or to make a living for themselves. John Wesley and the Methodist movement started micro-lending in the 18th century in England so that people could pull themselves up out of poverty. Because of all those actions, life was made better. 18th century England was on the, on the verge of revolution, a revolution that happened in France across the water, but in England it did not happen. And many scholars say it didn't because there was a different kind of revolution in which lives were made better by the action of many, many people who cared enough to act. So it's in our DNA to make the world a better place and to pay attention to what's going on and be engaged in the world so that our world is better. To be transformed by Christ so that we can be agents of transformation in what we do and the way that we live our lives. There's an old legend of a small village where and a river ran through the village and and someone noticed that there were babies floating down the river. Someone was throwing babies into the river and people started rescuing these children, pulling them out, and they gathered people together to pull these babies out of the river. And, and they, were, they were calling everyone in the village to come and help. But one person started walking upstream and they said, where are you going? We need your help. And he said, I'm going upstream to find out who's throwing the babies in the water and stop them. Do you hear the message of that old legend? What is the source of the issues that are making life difficult? And how can we make life better? That's our challenge in our day and time as it was in John Wesley's day and time, as it was in Jesus' time. And in every time, we are challenged as the followers of Jesus to be engaged in that sacred and important work my prayer for us as we go from this place to live our lives, as we move toward General Conference in May, that we not forget who we're called to be and that we're called to continue the mission of Jesus, to preach good news to the poor in our words and our actions, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to set free those who are held captive by whatever holds them captive, to be agents of those who help not only ourselves open our eyes to see God at work and to have hope, but also to be agents who help open the eyes of others to see clearly that we are children of God and we are all brothers and sisters. It's my prayer that we go from this place as God's people in the world, knowing that Christ holds out always the year of Jubilee, the new beginning, the fresh start. May we live into that and out of that with our own lives. Amen.